All right. Does that mean we can uh, do the real deal? Yes, it does. All right. Perfect. Well, all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September meeting of the City of Binghamton Planning Commission. My name is Nick Corcoran, and I am currently the chairman of this commission, which is comprised of local community members tasked with reviewing site plans and special use permits for consistency with the standards and criteria set forth in the City of Binghamton Code. Based on our total number of planning commission members, four members must be present to constitute a quorum. Uh, based on the list of attendees, it looks like we, we do have a quorum, but uh, let's uh, let's do roll call to make sure. Uh, all right, so Mario DeFolvio. Here. Paul O'Brien. Here. Joe D'Angelo is not going to be with us tonight. Uh, Chris Judges. Here I am, rocky like a hurricane. Uh, Kelly Weiss. Present. And Manny Priest. Here. All right. And I'm here. So that means we have six and we do have a quorum and can proceed. All right. I don't think we have any minutes to approve. Or Tito, do we have minutes to approve? Recording in progress. We don't have minutes, right? Okay. We can finish. Yeah. From July. Okay. <laughs> All right, so no minutes. All right, so then our first item on the agenda are seeker determinations. Uh, in this portion of our meeting, the Planning Commission will be re reviewing documentation provided by applicants for the first time. Applicants will be called to the microphone where they will be asked to make a presentation describing their plans to the Commission. Commission members may then ask questions of the applicant to clarify any items that are unclear. After all questions have been answered, the commission will deliberate and then either set a public hearing date for the project or request additional information before proceeding. Uh, to all applicants who will be presenting tonight, we ask that you please state your name and address for our records before beginning your presentation. Uh, and we ask that any member of the team, of your team, who will be speaking, please give their name and address for our public record. All right, so tonight, Our first seeker determination is for the applicant Stonebridge Campus Living. Project address is 221 Washington Street. This is a site plan modification to add basement social assembly space to multi-unit dwelling with 12 existing units and 45 total bedrooms in the C2 downtown business district. All right, is there anyone on for Stonebridge Campus Living? Hi, my name is Alyssa Post. And um, do you want my address that I'm at or 221 Washington? Hmm. Or okay. our office address. <laughs> office address would be great. Okay, 33 South Washington Street, Suite 3, Bing Up to New York, 13903. All right. There's two more people on my team, too, here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Billy Peterson, and I share the same office with Alyssa. And I promise I won't make any football jokes today. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Hi. My name says Alyssa Post, but it's Ellie Zakai, also at 33 South Washington Street. All right. That sounds great. Uh, what uh, What are you guys thinking about doing? Okay, um, so obviously 221 Washington Street, Binghamton, New York is the address that we're discussing. Um, we're looking to just get an occupancy level for the area to be an area of assembly. Um, as of our right of owning the building. All right, and so the use of the building, the way that the upper floors are already used, that's already been approved, that, that's been in front of us before. And those units are already full with people in them? Correct. Okay. Can you describe what's the basement gonna be used for? Um, we just want them to be able to use the area. It's an open space, but we have, you know, a sprinkler system to space of egress, um, you know, all the safety measures for fire. Um, we have security cameras. So we just, we want them to be able to gather down there um, for whatever they wish to do. Watch football games, Play game of pool. 
All right. Um, to provide a little bit more context, uh, the way we have it now is we kind of specialize in student rentals. Um, and as it is now, we don't share some of the basic similarities that a dorm may have, like a common space. And so our thought really here is if you're wanting to have a study group or go yoga or gym, whatever the case may be, you may not want to go up to someone's apartment where you never know who all is going to be there. So we have this space already in use uh, up until recently. It was primarily a laundry room. Um, it has been, you know, used for social gatherings as well. And that's really what we're trying to make use of the space is really turn it into an amenity space. Um, we want to make it where our kids are using at home versus out in public doing, you know, trying to find a place where they can socialize and study. And that's really our goal here. And part of why we wanted to come before the board is just to make sure we're doing it the right way, making sure that whatever number we specify to use the space is what we're following and enforcing and really just making sure that we're crossing our I's and T's while giving our residents every space opportunity they can have. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I ask, are you here proactively or are you here because you've been flagged for something? So it, it, a little bit of both. Uh, we actually had a, a sprinkler system that uh, when we were addressing, they went on and said, hey, we noticed that this space on paper is washer and dryers. If you're wanting to use it as a common space, you really need to go and get it permitted the correct way. And so that was news to us and we're not the landlord that tries to fly by night. So really once we became alerted of that, that's when we we're like, okay, let's do it the right way. And admittedly, this is new to us. Uh, this isn't a, a channel that we've really been down before. We were under the guise that it was permitted for a recreational space. Um, so it, it's a little bit of both, a little bit of learning and a little bit of making sure that we're being good stewards to the city the correct way. Okay. Um, and based on code, what is your occupancy limit in the basement or in the gathering area, labeled open area? As of right now, or if we get approved for the area of assembly? Uh, both. Um, I believe right now for the laundry room, um, per the zoning board, it's five to 10. Um, and then the area of assembly, um, we were just told that we would work with the fire marshal. They would come in. They've already come in once to confirm that we have everything set up the correct way. And then as soon as we got the approval, they would just set up an occupancy level and post it on the wall. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else have any questions about what's going on? Chris. Nick, so can I address the 500 pound gorilla in the room? Yeah. So there's um, initially in the staff comments, there was a comment about how the Office of Building Construction and the, poli the Binghamton Police Department expressed concern over the use of this uh, basement space for an assembly space. And then most more recently, the Binghamton Police Department, uh, Chief Stokuski has submitted a letter detailing some of his concerns um, and asking that this not be approved. Um, so my first question is, have the applicant been able to see this letter from Chief Sikuski? Um, Do they have some feedback? And I guess my next question would be, are you willing to meet with the police department to address their concerns? Because I'll be honest with you, if this were to go to a vote, Based on this letter alone, as is, I might be a very likely no vote, just to be fair. I, I would yeah. also. So that's, that's, I, I'm in agreement with Chris. This is Kelly. Uh, Manny here, same, same as Chris and Kelly. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so we became aware of the letter earlier today. Um, and I do want to start off by saying that we completely understand why a police department would have those concerns. 
there have been no issues that one that we're aware of, whether it be on paper or verbal, since I, I think Alyssa, our property walk notes are June of last year. Um, but with that said, we we support the police department and we absolutely would be welcome to walk it with them. We're more than on board with giving them access, a key to actually, you know, uh, go down there. We want to do it the right way and we have no reason to to not want the, a police presence there. Um, I, I remember reading on there that there was concern about drinking and so forth. Um, and that's a valid concern. Like I said, we specialize in student housing. So we try to not only maintain local ordinance, but also a presence with the school. Um, and could I promise you that wouldn't happen? No. Can I tell you that we want to make sure that we're following the rules to make sure everybody's safe and if they're going to do it, be inside versus outside in the streets? Absolutely. And if that means that the police want to come in and be a, a part of our community, we welcome that. All right. I think too, just to add, um, you know, obviously our leases are multiple, multiple pages long um, that we can add rules and regulations to surround this to work with the police. Um, I know they mentioned in there um, certain things that they were, you know, afraid of coming up. I do want to note that our tenants from this June of 2022 are all new residents in that building than they were prior. Um, so the rules and regulations going forth, the current tenants haven't even ever had access to this basement. Um, so we can definitely work with the police department to find out, you know, what those rules and regulations could be so that we could meet in the middle to make this a safe space for the community and our residents. All right. Last question. This is Brian Secret. I'm the counsel for the for the planning commission, and I was wondering: Is this area that you're talking? Is this a leased space? Is it in common, or is it leased to the tenants of the building as a whole? So it is common area to the tenants as a whole. Um, what we were always under the guise was use it as a gym, amenity, laundry space. And so when we have leased the building, again, not knowing that there was any sort of guys there, we told them this would be a space that they would have access to provided they followed the same rules and regulations outlined in the lease as we expect with their apartment as a whole. So is the goal to furnish this common space with exercise bikes, weight equipment, couches and chairs, yoga mats, and not just have it be like some sort of a wide open space for people to wear right. glow in the dark makeup and dance around under hallucinogenic mushrooms all night? Yeah, so 100%. So prior to when we were doing the renovations, when we became, you know, knowledge of this, any structure there that came in, that code enforcement came in has all been taken away. Everything's been taken out. It's a big open wide space now. Um, we have made a space ready for the gym. We're ready to make it at the gym as soon as it's approved. We're ready to put the pool tables in. We're ready to make it amenity space um, and not a big open area where they can do with what they please. Like we're very aware of that situation. And, you know, as a general manager here, we don't, I don't want that, you know, on me either. Okay. You know, I'm going to maybe ask this to Tito. Would it be appropriate to ask the applicants to submit some sort of a uh, um, a floor plan mock-up of here's how we see the layout of putting in potential pool tables and couches and and exercise bikes and things like that to is that an appropriate request before they come before a public hearing yeah they, so they they did submit the floor plan um and they do show the workout area on there um and the laundry room and, and some restrooms. The bulk of it though is shown as open area. So if the board, yeah, you can absolutely ask to show the space furnished um, or show more partitions or whatever you want to see there. Okay. But I, the other thing I would just recommend to the applicants is you can do all sorts of help make 
us happy, but I think the obvious thing is you need to make sure the police department's happy. Because I think many of yeah. us, unless the police department, uh, unless Chief Tukuski gives us an updated letter saying he's okay, this might remain problematic next month. Mm -hmm. I think what Mr. Judge is just trying to say is that the, the aesthetics of the building need to address the concerns the police raised about the building. Um, and I will tell you from council's perspective uh, and this planning bodies commission, I believe they're all have in mind a couple projects that have been were approved with amenity space like this. And even though the tenants or the landlord may have had the best intentions about how that space was going to be used, there were some huge parties that were there. They just busted the doors open and, you know, a thousand kids were inside this little basement with, you know, we'll call them dancers, uh, copious amounts of alcohol. Um, it was a pretty wild event and it was clearly not something that I think the land, even that landlord sanctioned and, and he was quite appalled by it. And so when you see this big wide open floor plan, it causes some concern for public safety officials and for the planning commission that it's going to create problems in that neighborhood. Um, with the forum directly across the street, church down the street, a couple of businesses right next to you, that, that all creates issues. And so the rest of the question is before next month, is there something you can do or put in place that would alleviate those concerns about public safety issues? Um, and I will tell you that like the other guy took some pretty good measures. I mean, he had Pass security passes on the doors. Only tenants to get in. They bypassed all that. They, I mean, they broke in other ways. It was. These are not ideal tenants. I will tell you that, in, in, from just my opinion of what I looked at, uh, and they probably were not cooperative. In fact, they ended up breaking the lease because they were not able to get that space, and they ended up putting all kinds of horrible social media out there about this particular landlord because they don't get their space. So I understand you're probably getting it from both directions, but from the public. Oh, public safety side of things, they need to see that this can be not only safe as in fire safety, but safe as in terms of how it will actually operate. All right. Um, any other questions before we uh, make a motion on the project to move it forward? Yeah, Nick, this is Paul. Yes. Um, there was another item on uh, Chief Sikuski's letter uh, stating that the uh, tenants, majority of which are members of a fraternity, is this a fraternity house? Excellent question. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Um, they're they're not a recognized frat through Binghamton University now. Let me unpack that. When you say they're not a recognized frat, they are a frat, but they're not recognized by the university. I mean, I wouldn't call them a frat if they just kind of like make up something. Uh, but no, so they're not. I guess like what I'm saying is, if you walk the other place I was just talking to you about, when you walked into that, there were the Greek letters all over those walls. I mean, they had totally renovated that space and made it like sort of like subway graffiti all over the walls, letting you know who owned that space. Are there Greek letters on the house or in the house? Are these your tenants members of a fraternity, a fraternity, whether it's recognized by the university or not? You are muted now. I'm sorry. Um, there's no Greek letters in the basement. There's no Greek letters in our lobby, hallway, anything like that. I do not know exactly what they have in their bedrooms, um, but they are not posted outside. They're not posted in our lobby, hallways. Anything and, and the other question, the other question that you typically ask me is, is it rented out as a building or is it rented out by individual units? It's rented out as um, a building. Okay. And how many bedrooms is it for the building? 45. So one lease for 45 bedrooms and you don't know whether they're fraternity or not a fraternity or just for 45 friends that moved in? No, I, I'm saying that they might say they're a fraternity. I'm just saying it's not through the university. They're not a recognized frat. So I was just saying that. Okay. You know, me well, and listen, I frat. thought we have individual leases per unit. We don't have it as individual leases per unit. Nope, it's all one lease. Yeah. Brian, 
Is that how this building is uh, recognized? Um, um, we don't have a control over how they lease the building. Okay. We have it as different units. If they choose to do one lease that covers all the apartments in it, that is that's fine. Um, the applicant should know though. Some of the worst fraternity houses in the city of Binghamton are ones that are unrecognized by the fraternity. Those are the ones that seem to kind of cause the most damage, both to the owner's property and in the neighborhood around them. I can tell you where the unrecognized frats are most years. Okay. All right. Well, maybe this is a, a relevant question. Then I, now that we're talking about this, have, have the police responded to this building in the last two years for um, for calls, for complaints? We have only owned this since uh, August of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, in the possession of when I was a general manager here, I was only known about in February and the end of January. But other than that, I have had no record of them after February or before January, end of January. No record of the police being called. Like they had not reached out to me. Code enforcement did not tell me. When code enforcement reached out to me at the beginning of February, they had only noted the last week of January and the beginning of February. For police calls? Correct. Do you mind elaborating on what those calls were about? Um, Just noise. Oh, okay. If the police were, were called to the building in that time since then, you would have a record of that, right? As the manager, you'd be aware of it? Correct. So when it was shut down, it's just been completely locked since any type of communication with the city. They have had zero access to that basement. So there has been nothing down there. The police have not been there at all. Um, and I've been in direct communication with code enforcement and, and Tito at the planning department, but that's that building, like the basement is locked completely okay all right anybody have any other questions before we uh kind of move things forward here yeah i had a quick question um is there a difference between because i'm now i'm looking at his letter it says something about below grade basement of any building used for gatherings below grade um does it matter if it's below grade or above grade that's my question. Is that just something the the chief decided to throw in there, or is that a, an actual fact? I don't believe. I'll try to answer that, Tito. This is Brian Seekers on, on council. Um, I will tell you that I don't think formally it has a play in the. Um, it's not something you're going to find in our zoning or planning regulations, but what it does play it's on the aesthetics and how the property operates, and it goes to how the effect it can have on the community. The experience in our community has been that these spaces, when they are below ground, they are much harder to police uh, because there's very frequently not windows, there's very frequently not good access to them. Um, and it creates a lot of issues for the police trying to determine when there's underage drinking, when there's large parties. I mean, the, the, the one that I was talking about prior, fortunately there was a bar above it, they heard the noise, they let somebody know, and First of all, the frat guys right at the door wouldn't let people in. And when they finally did let people out, you can set the body camera and just see this flow of people, human beings coming out. You know, it's like you just counted them like sheep, and there were a couple hundred people stuffed in this basement. Um, it's very dangerous. The front door was chat chain locked, uh, so there was only one way for these people to get out. But an incident in there would have been very dangerous. So. That's why the subterranean comes into effect because it usually min minimizes your means of escape in case of a fire incident. It also just creates policing hazards and people act differently when they feel like they're hidden away like that. All right. Uh, any anyone else? All right, if there's no other comments or questions from the Planning Commission. Um, sounds like you got a, a little bit of work to do between now and the next meeting. 
um, assuming we move forward with everything. Um, everything sounded okay to you guys? Yeah, I mean, you want us, us to submit a new plan, correct? And you want us to get together with the chief of police to see how we can make this work. Is that basically the next steps? Correct. Yeah. yeah that sounds great. Okay. All right, then I'll make a motion that the um, applicant's proposal is a type two action under seeker as it uh, involves the reuse of an existing commercial building, uh, which is a type two action under seeker and no further environmental review is required. I'll second, I second that. that. All right, seconded by Kelly and Paul. Uh, all right, all in favor? Uh, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes, sir. Joe, uh, sorry, Joe's not here. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Uh, and Manny? Yes. Yes, and I'm also a yes. All right, that's six in favor, zero opposed. And I'll make a motion that the, uh, for a public hearing, to set a public hearing date and time for this project at our October meeting for, Let's say five twenty-five. Seconded. All right. Seconded by Paul. All in favor? Uh, Mario. Yes. Paul. Yes. Chris. Yes. Kelly. Yes. And Manny. Yes. And I'm also a yes. So that's six in favor, zero opposed. All right. So you've got a public hearing date set for the next meeting. Uh, hopefully you can get a uh, revised plan submitted and uh, have a meeting with the police to get their, uh, I don't know if we're looking for their blessing or just the, so that they understand what you're trying to do. And then hopefully we'll hear from them directly on what their opinion of the project will be. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you. I, All right. I can also make a comment just on what you're probably looking for. Um, one of the things that we often get from applicants is uh, statements about, you know, I have this person in place who's going to supervise and make sure that this doesn't happen. The planning commission's perspective, though, is much longer than that. It's like 20 or 30, two people down the chain of title. If you sell the building, the next or third person, when this exists 20 years from now, how can you physically design this space so it doesn't get misused like the, their board's concerned? That's really... The, the the highest and best way you could address this. And I'm not certain how you do that, uh, but if you can figure out that, that's the type of thing that the that, that Planning Commission generally finds to be very persuasive. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Appreciate thank that. you. All right. Thanks, y'all. Nick, Nick, this is Tito. Uh, really quickly, before the next case, we, we had some audio issues before when you first asked the question, but we do have minutes. The minutes are for the July meeting since we didn't have an August meeting, and oh. those are on base camp. All right. Uh, let's take a second and take a step back. Did everyone have a chance to look at the July meeting minutes? Yes. All right. Anybody have any questions, concerns, revisions for those meeting minutes? And if not, is there a motion to approve? I'll, I'll move to approve the minutes. All right. Motion by Chris. I'll second. All right. Second by Manny. Uh, all in favor? Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes, sir. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Manny? Yes. All right. I'm also a yes. So it's six in favor, zero opposed. All right. All right, back to seeker determinations. So our next applicant is the Family Enrichment Network. Uh, the project address is 25 Doubleday Street. This is a site plan review and special use permit to convert an existing building into 10 one bedroom apartments in the R3 multi unit dwelling district. Uh, is there anyone on for the Family Enrichment Network? Hi, this is April Ramsey, Director of Program Development at Family Enrichment Network. Welcome. Thank you. This is 
this is Ken Gay from Keystone Associates. We're the architects on the project for Family Richmond. All right. All right, what are you guys thinking about doing? Yeah, so um, I'll go first, Ken. We're go looking ahead. to we're looking to convert the former convent on 25 uh, Double Day Street into 10 one bedroom apartments. That would be uh, a permanent supportive housing program for individuals experiencing homelessness. And the priority population would be young adults ages 18 to 25. We would provide obviously the single um, bedroom apartments coupled with case management services to help achieve uh, housing stability and self-sufficiency. All right. I'll, I'll add on to that as well. Uh, currently on the site plan, um, as you see, we are proposing seven standard parking spaces and one accessible space. These will be purchased uh, through Family Enrichment Network with St. Paul's Church. Um, we are, as outlined with the red outline on the site plan, you'll see the area that Family Enrichment is looking at purchasing. The existing garage in the rear of the property will remain. Um, as April noted, we're looking through funding through homeless housing, and we have been through the initial Chris review with the state historic and received approval for the project as well. We're not adding anything to the size of the building except for a small accessible ramp on the uh, side of the property towards the parking lot, which one would enter through there. We are changing internally to the project, um, the stairs uh, to make them accessible stairs um, in the middle of the building uh, as this, the project would have sprinklers and everything that's required per the occupancy. On the exterior of the building, we are changing some uh, exterior window locations to accommodate the revised floor plan, um, which are noted on the elevation sheet as well. All right. And can you explain the, um, you'll need an easement, I guess, for exiting out of the parking lot to the back or the way you've got the, you've got angled parking, so you're directing everyone onto the neighbor's property. Correct. We, we, we will enter off of Double Day, and th this was to accommodate and maintain the existing uh, parking striping in there and not uh, absorb uh, too much of the St. Paul's and still let them, you know, remain as many parking spaces as we could, but meet some of the needs of our facility. Okay. All right. So then you, you would have an easement with St. Paul's when you're done to exit out through their parking lot? Yes. Okay. So if you were to sell the building in the future, that easement would transfer to the next owner? I, I don't know that because that obviously St. Paul, Paul's would own that, but the easement could do that if, if, if need necessary. Okay. Brian, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I did want to ask a question. So are you buying the land that the parking lots are on or are you simply leasing them from St. Paul's? Yes, this is April. Um, we're purchasing the property with those spots for $95,000. Um, it's, it's pending approval with the archdiocese right now. Okay, and do you know whether they have gone to the start of the Supreme Court? Well, I guess until the diocese approved, they're not going to bring the legal proceeding to get permission. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, they, they are purchasing the parking spaces, but they would need an easement to make this a functional parking lot. So, uh, the planning commission could, if they were going to approve it, uh, make any approval subject to a grant, the granting of an easement in perpetuity to allow vehicles to exit through the St. Paul's parking lot. Yes. Okay. Piece of cake. Well, the other thing that would typically happen is because, are these two separate parcels right now? 
or are they one parcel? They're two separate. So typically what if there was a if there was an approval the requirement would be that the two lots be merged into one lot. And if potentially in the sale, if you get do go forward with the sale, you probably want to ask to include in the deed the easement that goes with this property provides for the parking in the deed of sale, a right of ingress and egress for purposes of parking so that the so that the Supreme Court, when it reviews this, can also include that in its approval so it don't have to go back again. When a non for profit alienates profit like the assets like this are a significant portion of their assets, it requires Supreme Court approval from New York State. So I would make sure that, that easement was part of that transaction when they go to the Supreme Court so that it's there's no question in the future that you, that they were had to ask permission to sell it okay, and to alienate you. it for easement. Thank you. All right, any other questions, concerns? Nick? Yes. This is Chris. Yeah. Um, two questions that were brought up on the staff report. Um, for These are for the applicant. Um, one question, will the applicant keep the red staircase on the eastern side of the building? I think it's like a, looks like a fire escape based on the one photo I saw here. We did not plan on keeping that staircase because it doesn't work with our floor plan. Okay, is that being replaced with some other appropriate fire escape thing that works with codes and zoning and blah, blah, blah? Well, the fire escape isn't part of the required code. The way the building works out, one internal stair is permitted with sprinklers and egress uh, rescue windows off of the upstairs, which we would plan for with a one egress building. And then the second thing I saw was on the staff report uh, uh, was going back to the parking. Uh, will there be any barriers separating the parking area that you guys are buying from St. Paul's from the rest of the St. Paul's parking lot? I, I don't know the answer to that. Ken, do you know the answer to that? Is that something we plan for or we could do? We had not planned for that. Uh, part of the reason would be snow removal, I would think. Uh, if you put a barrier there, then you're going to pile it up and, and really interfere with their driving lanes. Um, I guess it would be up to St. Paul's to let their parishioner knows about the spaces. Uh, that would be a logistical thing that would have to be worked through, I, I would believe, through signage or whatever. Uh, let me ask this towards the planning department. Tito, uh, do you guys care? If there's some sort of barrier separating these two sections of the parking lot, um, given that it's it's in a way shared parking, um, I would say, uh, you know, my my personal opinion or professional opinion would be that it's not a problem. That some signage or maybe like some painting on the you know these are reserved for family enrichment network. Don't park here, kind of thing. Correct. Yeah, I think the fact that there's an easement involved um, and that they're sort of reusing the existing parking space makes it more of a shared parking situation where, you know, a concrete physical separation may not be all that appropriate. And we do have a preference in our code for shared parking like this, rather than having to multiply parking lots throughout our neighborhoods. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Questions or comments? All right. Seeing no other questions or comments, uh, I'll make a motion that the proposal involves the reuse of an existing building, which is a type two on action under seeker and no further environmental review is required. I'll second that motion. All right. Second by Kelly. Uh, all in favor, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Man. Yes. And I'm also a yes. That's six in favor, zero opposed. And I'll make a motion to schedule a public hearing for the project at uh, 525 at the October 
meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, we just need a second on that. I need to vote. Second. second. All right, seconded by Paul. Uh, all in favor? Um, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Manny? Yes. All right, I'm also a yes. So that's six in favor, zero opposed. All right, so we'll see you back in October for a public hearing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Tito, could we uh, also receive the staff report? Oh, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so that concludes seeker determinations. Uh, so now we're on to public hearings and final deliberations. Uh, in this portion of our meeting, we'll be holding open public hearings to obtain public opinion in regard to specific projects that are up for review. Applicants will be asked to come to the microphone and make a brief presentation describing their project. And for most projects, this is the second time we were reviewing your information, so it would be very helpful if you could please give us a brief overview of your project to remind us what you're planning, and then clearly identify any changes that have been made since the last time we saw you. When the applicant is done presenting and any clarifications have been reviewed, we will open the public hearing and allow members of the community to speak about the applicant's proposal. After the commission has heard from all community members interested in speaking tonight, the public hearing will be closed and the commission will deliberate. To our applicants, when your project name is called, please come to the microphone and start off by giving the name and address of any member of the applicant's team that's planning to speak. And anyone from the community that will be speaking in regard to a project tonight, please also start off by stating your name and address for our records. Uh, so tonight, our meeting is on Zoom. And uh, let's see, to speak during the public hearing, commenters may call the planning department at 607-772-7028. Uh, commenters mentors will be allowed to speak in the order that calls are received. Unfortunately, calls cannot be queued. So if a caller receives a busy signal, um, please wait a minute and retry the call. And we'll take all the calls in the order that they come in. Uh, so again, the number to call 607-772-7028. All right, so tonight our first public hearing is for the applicant Marchuska Brothers Construction LLC. The project address is 49 Court Street. And this is a site plan review to add nine additional parking spaces to an existing 231 space surface parking lot in the C2 downtown business district. All right, anybody on for Marchuska Brothers? Oh yes, uh, Justin Marchuska, James Cameron, and James Cameron. Hello, welcome back. Hello. All right, can you give us a brief reminder of what you're thinking about doing and then let us know about any changes that have happened since last time we saw you? Well, since uh, the uh, last time we, we met, we uh, went to the uh, ZBA uh, to um, uh, eliminate that five foot landscape uh, barrier between us and the neighboring property. And uh, that, that was completed, went through with, a, I believe, a, a favorable result. Um, we were still maintaining that we'd like to add the nine parking spaces and uh, maintain the uh, five foot existing sidewalk. Um, uh, other than that, I think everything with the previous meeting and since our, our meeting here at the planning board has remained the same. James, do you wanna weigh in on anything or no? No, that is correct. I, I think everything is, has remained the same. All right. Uh, Nick, uh, from, from uh, our end, um, the only change is that we did get county comments. And it's my mistake, they're not, I did not upload them to Basecamp previously, uh, but they were made available to the ZBA before the ZBA meeting. And they're on Basecamp now and Sean can put them up if you all would like to see them. But the county recommended denial of this uh, proposal. And so um, the planning commission would need a super majority to override that. Okay, and can you remind me with uh, six members here tonight, how, what's that, a super majority of six? The super, so that's based on the board size. And so you would need five members. 
to vote uh, in favor of the site plan. Okay. Nick, it's a it's simply majority plus one. I got you. Okay. Um, before we go into the public hearing, uh, Justin, do you want to talk about the the staff, the planning staff? I think is kind of suggested a, a compromise solution with putting the, the trees back in around the perimeter. Do you want to comment on that at all? Well, we, we uh, I, I can only probably uh, take a comment on the uh, ZBA meeting. And uh, after discussing it with the ZBA members, um, what we came up with is as funds become available to us, we would add trees back in um, over a certain period of time. Um, we're, we're kind of struggling, um, like a lot of office owners with not having, you know, a completely full building. So, um, you know, un unfortunately, people are working from home and um, we're, we're trying to do the best we can with the current, um, with the current uh, situation in the world today. Um, we also are also trying to accommodate uh, people who come into the parking lot you know, because we get a certain level, people during the day and after hours we use the parking lot um, for uh, different events, eat dinner, um, and then generally walk, you know, shopping and whatnot downtown. So it's kind of a twofold. It's 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 community based, and then it's also to help uh, maintain our tenants in the building, and also hopefully um, uh, hopefully accommodate new tenants that will come in the building too. Okay, when you say uh, planting the trees as you can afford it, is there a timeline on that? Um, we, uh, when we, our last meeting, they didn't put a timeline on it, but um, uh, they did, you know, we just said we would do it, we would do it over time. Um, and we, you know, if there's, if it's any indication of the type of landlord we are with the building, I mean, we, we, we keep the building extremely nice and we continue to improve it. So. Um, we do, we do, we do what we say we're going to do. So um, I would say over the next several years, maybe over the next three years. Um, but it's just something that we're just, at this point trying to deal with the immediate issue of parking continuing to be a strained issue in and around our building, especially during the day. Okay. Uh, yeah, Chris. Um, this question I see maybe for Tito. Tito, I, 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 I think I must have missed it. What, what is the county's objection? Why are they recommending denial? So the county, in a nutshell, and we can you see the comments up right now? Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, well, yeah, but I, got, I just got to blow up my screen so I can make them, so I can read them. <laughs> it's like on a two-point font on my screen. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, they agree with most, most of our comments that, that the removal of, of all trees and, and a lot and a bulk of the vegetation on that site over time was inappropriate, especially sort of in the heart of downtown. Um, and that expanding surface lots with no landscape buffer and, and no trees um, is contrary to, to the city comprehensive plan, to the county comprehensive plan, to just best practices in general. Um, and that it conflicts with some of the efforts that the city and the county are making right now to, to sort of beautify that area through the DECO district. Tito, from the, the time a site plan is uh, approved through this process, uh, how long does an applicant have to, let's say, to, to plant stuff before they would get uh, cited? Um, usually they have a year to complete a project before they use it. Uh, this would be a little different because they would, I'm assuming, try to use the surface parking lot before they plant anything. Um, so, you know, I, I, Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you could do a special condition that says that you know, X number of perimeter trees need to be planted within 24 months from the, you know, filing of the decision or something like that. Typically, uh, what is approved in a site plan has to be completed within 12 months. However, there are times when you extend that time. 
and you can do have the right to do conditions for the for the whole parcel as part of this approval and you can do a staggered timeline saying you know and you can make it longer than a year if you if you wanted to uh, as long as there was compliance at each step at each benchmark that we set okay All right, well, let's do this. Let's uh, open the public hearing, uh, let people talk about the project, and then we'll come back and revisit this. All right, so this is, or we're gonna open up the public hearing for the applicant uh, Marchuska Brothers Construction LLC. The project address is 49 Court Street. This is a site plan review to add nine additional parking spaces to an existing 231 space service parking lot in the C2 downtown business district. Uh, if anybody would like to call in to comment, the number is 607-772-7028. And if you're on the Zoom call and you want to comment, uh, you just raise your hand and we'll try and take everybody in order that they raise their hand. All right, so I think we got, well, it looks like Mr. Yanadi labeled as Justin Marchuska. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you hear me okay? Yes, there we go, yep. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> for, for a minute, I wasn't sure if it was Justin Marchuska <laughs> or Elton John on the other line. I love the glasses, Justin. <laughs> Good evening, uh, uh, planning board members. I'll, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, first of all, I'll tell you that Martuska Brothers is a direct competitor of mine in the nature of real estate. I have a, I hold them with high regard with respect to how they maintain their property. Uh, I think they set a great example of how things should be maintained and kept in our area, especially the downtown business district. This is a little bit of a sensitive subject for me because I am involved you know, my office is downtown, my business and my wife's business are downtown, one restaurant, one uh, retail. <clears throat> and I also have residents that live downtown. And one of the biggest challenges constantly is parking. And it's, it's, it's uh, lost me the opportunity to have tenants here in our market. It's, it's um, allowed me to also lose tenants for living downtown. And I've also had to hear from our customers repeatedly that we don't come to your place because there's a deficiency of parking in downtown. And a lot of things we don't have control of. And, and look, over time, um, and I'm not taking pot shots, the city hasn't really maintained their parking garages. They've become, they've, they've, to the point where they've had to be torn down. There's another pending project. There has been a lot of, uh, of positive movement in the downtown at a time where we've really needed the most parking ever. It's a totally different creature now than it was historically. And there's a tremendous deficiency. So here you have a landlord or a developer that wants to put parking. And I think we all have wish lists. And I, I understand it would be nice to have trees and all that things. But you also have to look at the challenges that people have in their businesses. You know, we've gone through a horrible time, uh, you know, the past 24 months. I don't think it should recreate the world, but you have to be a little bit sensitive to that. Things are a lot more challenging now. And by not embracing this and allowing them to move forward with this, with, with this additional parking, it's, it's not only hurting them, but it's hurting other things. It's hurting people that would go to the forum or people that would shop retail or people that will go to restaurants. So I'm hoping that you guys will look really long and hard over this. Um, I think there's bigger things in the city that we have to wor worry about that need our attention. Um, I commend all of you for giving your time to this, you know, uh, the, you know this committee and board. But I think it's really important to embrace anybody who wants to make the financial investment into our into our downtown to, to help it better. And look, in time, you know, I don't think you should draw a line in the sand. I think that based on how they maintain their property, if it enhanced their property in time, 
then maybe take their word that they'll add plantings or things that will enhance the area. But it's very hard in this business to commit because in three years, maybe he won't have four tenants in his building. So now his, his cash flow is negative. But um, so rather than, than, than have all these conditions, I think you have to kind of show a little bit of good faith and allow him to move forward this in hopes that, that, uh, that there'll be some plantings. But I want to uh, just emphasize again, my positive support for this. It's, it's a win-win for everybody, the city, the county, office space, residential, uh, you know, the forum, retail, everything. So those are my two cents. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. All right. Anybody else on the Zoom call want to raise their hand? Sure. Did I miss, did we give out the number for people who want to call in? Yes, but I can do it uh, one more time. Uh, the phone number for anybody who would like to call in is 607-772-7028. Uh, Tito, at this point, do we have any phone calls? We have no phone calls, and I just want to uh, say that if you're an attendee on this uh, call and you're here to speak about uh, this project, please use the uh, raise hand function, and we can give you permission to talk. All right. So we have um, Olivia. Olivia, you can speak now. Do you state your name for the record? Hi, my name is Olivia LaRocchia. Um, I'm a student at Binghamton University. I'm a graduate student. Um, I'm studying sustainability. And um, uh, so we like to think about all of the different aspects of city planning, you know, economic, environmental, and social. And um, this seems like a really interesting um, issue that includes all of these things. Um, I think we've had some insight from the economic perspective as to why it might be important to have these uh, new parking spaces. And I see the value in that, but just to provide a counter, um, I think, you know, the environmental benefits of having trees downtown, it's good for, you know, the psyche of, um, our residents who walk around every day to see, you know, some greenery. Um, and instead of seeing that get torn down, seeing that maintained, um, I would like to see, you know, a promise from the people who would like to establish these parking spaces to um, increase vegetation, if that's, um, you know, where this is leading, that the parking spaces will be uh, there. Um, yeah, I think par the parking spaces do have a lot of benefits, but I don't think we should forget about um, the environmental and health benefits of, you know, having vegetation downtown in a highly um, commercialized uh, area. All right. Thank you. All right, anybody else on the Zoom call want to uh, raise their hand? You know, have there been any phone calls? I suppose. Uh, no. Uh, will any, uh, do any of the other attendees have any comments on this project? Are you any of you here to comment on this project? If so, please raise your hand. All right. Well, seeing no other hands raised and no phone calls come in, I think we'll close the public hearing on this. All right. Anybody have any 
questions or comments? Planning board members, Chris. Yeah, Nick, I'm just, I'm looking at the uh, the site plan um, that was submitted and I won't lie to you, I'm, I, there's, from what I'm seeing here, there's not gonna be a large amount of real estate that's gonna be paved to create these extra nine parking spots. I mean, I, with all due respect to everybody out there, this is hardly going to get Joni Mitchell to write another song about. Um, so I, I, with all due respect to the county and their objections, I have no problem approving the site plan as is and as submitted um, and not requiring the applicant to commit to planning X number of pieces of vegetation by a certain date to have them extend the parking spots by a few feet, uh, was it nine by nine by 18 to add those extra nine spots? I mean, it's, I don't know. We're not, we're not paving over paradise here. Gotcha. All right, anybody else, uh, planning commission members want to weigh in on, um, let's just uh, clarify, so, the staff comments or the updated staff report. They're asking as a compromise for eight trees in the buffer along State Street and four trees in the buffer along Henry Street. So then on total, they're asking for 12 trees which is a considerable reduction from what a parking lot of this size would require if uh, if it came in new, which it's not, but, uh, but it did have trees in there previously that were removed, which is questionable about whether or not they're required. But so, so the last comment in here, it's the staff's position that restoring the recommended 15 trees so 12 to 15 trees around the perimeter is a reasonable request. So it would have a significant impact on the surrounding area. Uh, the city is making a large investment in streetscape improvements through the Deco District project uh, right nearby. Anybody wanna comment on that? Anybody else have any thoughts about that? Uh, Nick Manny here. Uh, I'm always a fan of compromise, but I do appreciate you know the lack of immediacy. Um, for the, the, these trees. And I think, you know, putting 12 trees over three years, if the applicant would be willing, might be a, a reasonable compromise, but we'd have to see if the applicant would be okay with that. All right, I, I think that sounds like a fantastic compromise on a compromise. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm in for that too. Okay. Justin, how do you feel about 12 to 15 trees over a three year period? as a compromise, a condition of approval? Um, I guess what I would say is uh, we, we were hoping to have, you know, do this in faith and not have it part of the, as, as a requirement um, because, you know, like Mark brought up just with where things are going. I mean, we, we do the best we can with the building. I mean, like, for example, this, this weekend Luma went on, I was, eating dinner 9 30 at my home in skinny atlas okay and the commitment i have to the uh, the city of binghamton I finished dinner i got in my vehicle and drove back i didn't have a home there i could go back to binghamton because we just we we were using our parking lot we have a gate there and you can you know check out with a credit card but because there was such a shortage i guess and i don't know i don't know the factual numbers but my understanding because Luma, they were using like one of the parking garages or something. And I don't, I don't know exactly, but my understanding was there was very limited parking that was available. And I stayed there till about one o'clock in the morning on Saturday night. My brother was there too, none of our employees, because, you know, we weren't expecting to be there. I mean, when we, when there's forum events and whatever, we're there. So, uh, but people, even though they had to wait a pretty considerable amount of time to exit the lot, uh, we're just thankful to have that parking around. So um, just to echo the sentiments, I mean, we, we really are 
doing a service. And I mean, the commitment I have, people who are there will, will, will attest. I, I was there, you know, like I said, Larry and I, I was eating dinner. I saw it on my cameras and we, we take owning the building seriously. And it shows by how we maintain it and how we maintain the grounds. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely do our best efforts, but I would just uh, I'll appreciate if there could be the, you know, comp a further compromise to say, you know, we'll, we'll do, do the best we can, but we just, we don't know where the economic or, or environment's going to be with, with the building itself over that period of time. Um, well, I think, I think our problem probably is rooted in uh, something Brian alluded to in the, in the earlier project. So I, I'm pretty sure everybody on the planning commission probably fully agrees that um, Marchuska brothers, no problem. We could do a good faith agreement with you. Just, you know, everybody sees you around. They hound you every once in a while and be like, hey, what about those trees? But the problem is if for whatever reason you sold the, the building, you sold the, the area, now the next person, there's no record that they're required to do this. And, and that's forever. They, there's no record of it. They wouldn't be required to ever do anything. So if we could get a, if we can put it as a condition to, to push it out and give you three years to, to get it in, uh, to take, uh, to actually do it, that gives you a, a lot of time to, you know, to figure out the tenants, and, uh, uh, the, how you spread out the costs, uh, uh, that whole thing. But I guess it also it gives you the option of in three years if you're unable to install any of it because the building is just a giant money suck. <laughs> uh, you could come back uh, and ask for uh, forgiveness on it, or uh, you submit a site plan. Yeah, site plan modification. A site plan modification that didn't show any of the trees at all, and then you could you could ask for. Yeah, no trees at that point. And it would just be the same process. You have to hop on for a couple of meetings and ask for no trees. But I think there's enough people involved in the request to have the trees put back in that it's sounding to me like you probably would not get a, approval tonight if you want to not have the trees as a condition of approval. Up, up, and, and this is with all due respect, Nick, um, sure. everyone, since we cut the trees down and, and I know the board, like I respect, you know, what the board does, but, you know, we, we have people who have come up to us up to this meeting. No one has, to be honest with you, I said anything about the trees or if, look, if trees made a difference there, I would have planted trees to help me rent the building. I would have planted them a long time ago. Um, beyond that, I also know, because I was on the committee for the DECO district, you know, with, with the work they're doing, is there a certain level of landscaping? I know that there's pump outs on the corners of, I think even there at the corner of uh, Henry and State, and that's gonna add vegetation there. Um, I, I haven't looked, I didn't look at the final one, but I think that's gonna add a decent amount of vegetation where my trees, although I, I do respect that, I think you're gonna see, uh, you know, you're gonna see a quite a bit of vegetation going in with that around, you know, the State, State Street, Henry Street, at least, when I, when I was involved with it in the past with wet, wet hem landscaping went out from Ithaca. I haven't seen the final plan, but that mm -hmm. was my understanding. So I, I understand and respect it completely and what the board does. But I, I do know that that's probably going to add quite a bit right there from what, what they're doing. All right. Well, I guess I got to, I got to leave it in your hands. What would you like us to do? We can move make a motion for approval as is with no trees uh or we could make a motion for a conditional approval with uh, 12 i guess we have to put a number on it so let's can we go with 10 10 trees 10 trees over three years does it really make that much of a difference uh, it, it, i'm just i'm just saying i i like i say i, I think you're going to see once that landscaping goes in it's not going to really make a difference what we're doing i mean and, and one thing uh, what chris mentioned earlier is where we're adding it it's we're adding you know pretty minimal amount of parking spots and we aren't you know removing trees we're actually taking out hard you know impermeable 
um, you know, sidewalk and pavement and then adding um, parking spots. So it's kind of a one for one thing. Um, well, I, I don't know, I just, I see, I, you know, it just seems like we get a lot of positive um, uh, comments that, you know, from our tenants of how, how it currently is. And that's the only thing I was bringing up. Sure. Well, let's say the, the, the conditional approval will, will stick to uh, the city's recommendation, the planning board's recommend, or planning department's recommendation of 12 trees with the compromise over 36 months. So up to the three years to, to get them in. And then I guess it's up to you. Do, do you want to do the conditional approval or would you like to do a, just a straightforward as is, no trees? I can, we can put forward either motion. I'm pretty, I'm Mr. Pretty Chairman, sure. you, you can make the motion either way. You, you, I'm just, I'm letting you know that most likely it's sounding like the motion as is, is probably not looking like it's going to pass. But the conditional approval for 12 trees over 36 months sounds like it has some uh, momentum. Well, Nick, 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 let me do this. Yeah. I'll make the motion. Maybe there won't even be a second, but I'll make it because I support it with no, with no tree issues. Perfect. I'll make the motion to approve the site plan without any conditions on tree plantings. All right, that sounds great. Is there a second? <laughs> Is there a second? Yes. All right, it looks like there is not a second for that motion. Uh, Justin, are you okay if we do the other motion with the 12 trees over 36 months? Yeah, I, I guess, I guess so, yeah. Look, if that's what we have to do. Okay. I mean, I guess the other option is is we don't make a motion at all. If you, well, you we're, we're trying not to, making a motion is not a good idea because that would result in approval. What you were, I think, what you're saying, Nick, is you would make a motion to deny. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I'll make a motion uh, for. Sorry, hold on one second. I just have to look and make sure of what we're uh, making a motion for. All right, so I'll make a motion that the requirements for site plan review and, uh, sorry, for site plan review have been met conditional that the applicant install 12 trees within 36 months of approval. Um, and that they use the the city's street tree uh, recommended street trees uh, from the shade tree commission list or uh, other species that the planning department is uh, is okay with. I'll second. All right. So that's seconded by Manny. All right. Um, all in favor. Uh, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Uh, Chris? Uh, a reluctant yes. I prefer no trees. Okay. Uh, Kelly? Yes. Uh, and Manny? Yes. All right. I'm also a yes. So that's six in favor, zero opposed. And just for the record, that does meet the requirement of a supermajority, so it can be approved over the county's objection. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. All right. So that's uh, on to our next public hearing and final deliberation. So our next uh, applicant is one. Sorry, the next applicant is 168 Water LLC. Project address is 168 Water Street. And this is a site plan review for the conversion of floors two through five of an existing commercial building to 18 dwelling units with 26 total bedrooms in the C2 downtown business district. All right, is there anyone on for the 168 Water Street project? 
Yes, Josh Bishop here. Hello, Josh. Hi. <laughs> All right. Would you mind giving us a brief review of what you're doing and let us know if anything that's changed between last time and today? Yep. Um, so a brief overview. Um, so this is the Water Street Brewing building there on the first floor. Um, they're staying, of course. Um, so we're proposing 18 apartments on floors two, three, and four total. Um, these are mostly one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and a couple three bedrooms. Um, the building's about 24,000 square feet. Uh, there's nine parking spaces at the building currently. Those will remain as is. Um, there's currently a dumpster in the back of the building on the north side that will remain where that is as well. Um, there are two means of egress already, which is great. Um, that's mostly it. Um, we are, you know, this is market rate housing. We're looking for young professionals, people that work downtown. Um, it's a little bit, a little bit higher end product, similar to what we did at the old Ellis building. Um, you know, stone countertops, nice finishes. Um, I think that's mostly it. All right. Uh, anybody have any questions before we go to public hearing? See, Chris has switched over to spooky mode. Well, the, the county office building, they shut off the lights, I guess. Right. <laughs> Previously, it didn't matter because there's enough sunlight, but it's gloomy enough and dark enough that I'm, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, mood lighting now for the rest of the meeting, I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, well, seeing no questions or comments, we'll open the public hearing. All right. So this is the public hearing for 168 Water LLC. Uh, the project address is 168 Water Street. This is a site plan review for the conversion of floors two through five of an existing commercial building to 18 dwelling units with 26 total bedrooms in the C2 downtown business district. If there's anybody on the Zoom call that would like to speak, if you could uh, use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen, we'll call on you. And if anybody would like to call in to comment, the number is 607-772. 7028. No calls and uh one second while we check attendees. Okay. No hands raised. All right. Uh, we'll give it one more minute while we're waiting. Uh, Josh, what's uh, the existing floors two through five, what's on them now? Yep, um, so they were formerly professional offices. Um, the tenants have all left You know, prior to us acquiring the building. Um, so the renovation up there for the offices was probably done in the 90s, maybe. Um, there used to be uh, legal aid services was in there. Um, some offices for the former owner. Um, all offices, though, no apartments. Okay, and so they're all empty right now? They're, yep, all empty. All right. All right. Well, any calls, Tito? No. All right. And no hands raised. So I think we'll close the public hearing for 168 Water. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments or concerns? All right, um, so at the last meeting, we determined that this was a type two action. So 
no other gotcha. environmental review was required. So I'll make a motion that the requirements for site plan review have been met. I'll second that motion. All right, seconded by Chris. All in favor, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Manny? Yes. Uh, and I'm also a yes, so that's six in favor, zero opposed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, that concludes public hearings and final deliberations. So now we're on to other business. Uh, so the first item on there is the student housing legislation. Brian or Tito, I'm guessing you guys have something to talk to us about that. Student, uh, student housing. We're on to that. Oh, we're on. I'm sorry, I just I have stepped out. So we're on this. Fairview Recovery Services withdrew their application. We just had to have them on the agenda um, to sort of officially close things out. <clears throat> so, for the student housing legislation, did everybody get a chance to look at it? Is that it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So just really briefly, the purpose of the legislation is, is sort of twofold. The first is that in our zoning ordinance, a dwelling unit has to be occupied by a family or a group that functions like a family. And so that's, that's tough to enforce for the zoning officer, because if he gets a complaint and it's typically about a group of students uh, living in a unit, in a in a residential area that is predominantly single unit dwellings he has to go in and sort of basically assess their lifestyle and determine if they're a family or not and it's sort of subject subjective so that doesn't really work and the zoning officer really shouldn't be in a position to make that type of assessment so what this legislation does is it states explicitly um, and this would be in the zoning code that a group of four or more college students is not a family unless certain uh, other conditions are met. So this makes it so that the zoning officer is making an objective uh, statement about the occupants of a unit and they're either students or they're not. So that's one thing that the legislation does is, is make that enforcement easier. The other thing is that there's a rezoning portion of it. Um, so the if you had a moment to take a look at the map. There's an area of the west side, sort of that eastern portion uh, between Chestnut and Front Street that we know that that's where students are predominantly. Um, and, and so what this would do is this would expand the R3 zoning district in that area uh, and expand the area where students could live legally. So again, we know that area is predominantly occupied by students. It has been for decades. Um, and that's the predominant character of the neighborhood now. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for, uh, to us for groups of students to be forbidden from living there. Um, that would be difficult to enforce. It would displace a lot of students, displace a lot of people. So what we're proposing as part of this is to convert an area that is R2 which is a good size chunk of that, of that uh, eastern part of the west side, um, where all dwelling units must be occupied by a family. We're converting that to R3, where congregate living is a permitted use. And congregate living is just basically a residential unit where uh, the occupants are unrelated um, and it's, it's rented by the room. So we would make, we would create sort of a path to legalize student housing in that student area. And then the other part of the rezoning is that there's a small piece of that R2 area uh, adjacent to Riverside Drive that would be converted to R1, where it better fits the neighborhood character of that of that block. Um, so, so again, there's those two things: is we're changing the definition of family to make enforcement uh, streamlined and more clear, and we're expanding the uh, area where students can le legally live on the west side. 
Tito, um, a, a process question, if you will. Um, I'm assuming we're one of like 45 steps. This also gets approved by city council, maybe by the zoning board, et cetera, et cetera. I'm assuming also there's going to be some sort of uh, public hearings for the public to mouth off on this. I should, let me rephrase that for the public to to provide their input on this. If they, especially if they're living in this yellow box, you know, between uh, you know St. John's Ave and Oak Street. Uh, yeah. So what what you all are doing is voting to give a recommendation to city council. City council is the body that has the authority to approve or deny this. The planning commission has input whenever, whenever zoning is involved. So okay. you guys would be voting to give a recommendation to city council to approve the text amendment and the rezoning to deny it or to approve it with certain conditions and certain changes. Um, and then it would go to city council who would have their own public hearing. And actually we did advertise this meeting in the paper, I, I guess for August, but it's been, it's been made public that this yeah. meeting is happening and we, we are going to allow public comment um, tonight. It's not in the oh, official okay. public hearing section of the agenda, but um, we do have, uh, we, we are making it available for people to comment. Okay. You know, so these, uh, if these changes are enacted, um, it doesn't override any of the area requirements or number of parking spaces required per unit or uh, any, any of the changes we recently made uh, previously to try and limit the number of units or the number of beds that could be crammed into these, some of these houses. It doesn't change any of that, correct? No, it does not. No, it does not. Um, if you are in this newly expanded legal area, you would, and you wanted to add bedrooms or create a new congregate living building, you would still need to meet all the uh, bulk requirements, all the area regulations, parking regulations, et cetera, uh, for that type of development. Okay. Off the top of your head, just as a reminder, because I kind of, it all gets a little muddy. If somebody wanted to, convert one of their houses to a congregate living building. Uh, I forget, what, what are the requirements for that as far as what are our, what, what's our ability to limit how many rooms they could uh, consider a, a rentable room? So congregate living uh, is capped at 10 sleeping rooms in a, in a single congregate living unit. And congregate living has a higher parking requirement than than dwelling units do, and so how you know the density would be determined by whatever the constraints are on that site. If they can't provide the parking, um, then then they can't they wouldn't be able to to build that many units. Great. So the reality is, I guess I, the argument ag against uh, this has been well this is going to i mean the students are just going to flock to this the people are going to be carving up their houses into huge rental units and making all these changes that's going to completely change the character of the neighborhood for the people that have been living there for years and are not interested in this but that's that's probably not an accurate depiction of what's going to happen correct yeah, the physical changes, we already, you know, we took that first step in 2019 to, to sort of curb the chopping up of houses. Um, and this is sort of the next logical step is we stopped the, or slowed the physical changes uh, and, and huge increases in density. Um, and now we're sort of addressing this part of it, which is that, that functional family rule. Okay. And Tito, if, if I understand correctly, this map, um, the, um, I mean, I guess I'm, only, I'm, I'm looking at it on my computer screen. You got it up on the, on the shared screen too. But the map that you've got displayed, um, what this map is doing, if I understand correctly, is better reflecting the reality that's already on the ground. You're not, you're, you're, we're not doing this to encourage more students to move into this neighborhood. This is reflecting the reality there already are many students already living in this neighborhood, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And the okay. purpose is to be able to um, sort of 
stop the spread of this type of housing into neighborhoods where single and two family houses are, are the predominant type of, of unit. We want to make sure that we're preserving our housing stock um, for potential home buyers and, and for family type uh, renters as well. Um, and so we, the purpose is to sort of enforce, is to have an easier way to enforce the family rule outside of this expanded area. In this student area, we wanted to make sure that it was legal um, for to rent to students because again, we know that they're there. We looked at the map, at the ownership of the map. A significant majority of the properties are owned by LLCs, many of which we know uh, sort of cater to that student market. We weren't trying to sort of punish those landlords or those students that live there. Again, we recognize that that's the character of that neighborhood. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that it was legal for students to live there. Um, uh, and again, it's gonna be legal and sort of regulated uh, versus being in this sort of illegal gray area that it's in now where uh, a student group uh, renting in this area right now is technically not allowed to live there. And that, you know, that can give some insecurity to that group and to the landlords as well. All right. All right. Anybody else, uh, Planning Commission members, have any other comments, questions? I just want to say I think this is a great idea. The idea that we can help, uh, you know, as, as Tito mentioned, the idea that you know the Planning Commission can help approve this map and make sure that we can keep some of those further west neighborhoods, you know, in their current character. I think is a great idea. We should open it to the public, though. Let them. Give their input. Okay. All right. Are we considering this a public hearing? Yes. Yes. All right. All right. So let's open up the public hearing for I'm sorry uh, for the student housing legislation. So if there's anybody that's on the Zoom call that would like to speak, um, if you could please hit the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen uh, of the Zoom program. We'll try and take you in the order that you raise your hand. And if there's anybody listening that would like to call in, uh, the number to call is 607-772-7028. Uh, and just a reminder, if you get a, a busy signal, um, it's because we can't uh, put the calls on in a queue. So if you just wait a second and call back, um, you should be able to get in. All right, any uh, any hands raised? Um, no one, nope. No hands raised. All right. Again, if any of the attendees, if you have any comments, please use the raise your hand function and we will give you permission to speak. So uh, Austin Donaldson has his hand raised. Austin, you can go ahead and uh, state your name uh, and address for the record. Hi, this is Austin Donaldson. Our address of record is PO Box 2910, Binghamton, New York. I represent Amicus Properties. Um, we, we've been in talks and what the, the applications of this would do. And our biggest concern, I guess, is on existing lots, if they were required to go for congregate living, but don't have the parking requirements. I mean, I'm even thinking about some houses that have only four bedrooms in them where there's no parking, no parking as is currently, how would those ones be affected with the congregate? living requirements of one parking spot per um, bedroom in the house. So I know that 50% of the parking requirement can be waived, but on those extraordinary lots where there is no parking available, how would those be handled? So Nick, should I go ahead and answer that or? Yeah, that's an excellent question. 
Yeah, so if um, if you have, the way this legislation is, is written, anything with five plus bedrooms would be considered congregate living. So if you have a legal uh, unit that is according to our records on paper, five plus bedrooms, um, then that's legal non-conforming, that's grandfathered in, so to speak. Um, if you have uh, a unit that is not legally recognized uh, as is, then on a case-by-case -case basis, that would either have to go to the planning commission or be uh, sort of reformatted somehow. Um, but again, if you if you have documentation that you have a legal non-conforming five bedroom, six bedroom unit, um, then you should be okay as far as congregate living is concerned. You would be considered a legal congregate living facility. You know, the other option is that if there is more than, you could have up to three people per unit without triggering the definition, without hitting the definition of a family is the way it's being redefined. That's that's correct. Yeah, if you have three or less people, this is effectively would not be uh, enforceable. So that's not three people in the building. That's three people in a unit. So if you had a large building that was two units, you could have six people. If you had three units, you could have nine people. Right. So the the gap there would be four bedroom units because they're not covered by the current living change. They're not covered as being three bedrooms or less. And so in those instances. Uh, there, you would have to potentially make some changes if it's if, if it's an illegal use or if it's a use that's recognized as, let's say, a single family house that you plan on renting to unrelated students. All right, excellent answer, uh, Austin. Any other? Comments? No, I, I think I think we're good from our end. I mean, it's it's just some of these properties that are a little bit odd. I'm just looking at the map here. For example, if you go down Chapin Street and uh, want two properties in, there's a tiny lot there that it doesn't have any parking. That kind of it backs up to those lots that are on Leroy. Um, you know, it, it just extraordinary circumstances where the lot size, even if even if we could add parking, won't provide for it. I guess in those situations, like how would so all of a sudden we could only have two people or three people in in the house? Is that how I'm understanding it? Yeah, essentially, you'd have to reduce the number of bedrooms to what could be supported by parking on site. Um, the other thing I'd like to add is that the code requires that congregate living have parking on site. Um, if the planning commission thought it was appropriate, uh, we could add to the amendment, uh, we could make a change to that rule in the amendment where offsite parking within 250 feet, let's say, would be allowable for congregate living. And that way we can meet the parking needs of the neighborhood without without potentially triggering sort of wide scale um, reconfiguring of, of a lot of units in this area. That sounds pretty good to me. How's everybody feel about that 250 foot radius? Makes sense. Yeah, I'm okay with it. I'd support that. All right. All right. Anybody else uh, want to make a comment tonight? All right. We got our councilman. Hey, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, Tito, I, I'm wondering, are there properties that are going from R3 to R2 that are being grandfathered in that will be allowed to keep students living there? Um, so 
No, anything that's R3 right now, which is the darker yellow on the on the top of the map there, that's there's no change there. So there's nothing that's going from R3 to R2. Um, the only change is there's a, there's a part of uh, this, uh, the large part of the area is R2. Uh, that's going to be becoming R3. There's a small part that's R1 on Chestnut that will be becoming R3. And then uh, down at the bottom, I don't know, Councilman, if you can see the map, but the area outlined in blue, that's R2, and that will be coming, becoming R1. And the reason we did that is, again, that's a better fit for the character of the neighborhood to the south, which is R1, and the ownership of, of those properties was, was predominantly uh, not LLCs, not, not rentals. So, but are, are there some that then would be allowed to um, be non-family in, in this new district? I don't have the map in front of me. Uh, yes, yeah. So the, the purpose of expanding um, the R3 district is so that there is, there is a way for congregate living, which is, in other words, is unrelated people living together there's a way for congregate living to be legal in this area. So, um, so I guess the short answer is yes, there will be properties grandfathered in in this area that are renting to students that will be allowed to continue doing so. So if they're grandfathered in, so the other properties wouldn't be allowed in that area except for the ones being grandfathered in, is that correct? Uh, no, uh, a, an applicant, a property owner could come in and turn, let's say, a two-family house or a single-family house in this area into congregate living if they can meet the requirements. Right. And they would have to go to the planning commission as well. But in the R1, where the, the, the then we wouldn't be, people aren't being grandfathered in in some fashion. If, it, if it's R1, if it's going to be R1 after this legislation is passed, there will not be congregate living allowed in the R1 or the R2. Um, and it okay. will only be allowed in the R3s with some evidence that it's grandfathered in or with planning commission approval. In the commercial district, it, it's it's sort of a moot point because there's no right. family rule in, in non-residential districts. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilwoman Riley, you can speak now. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, I was not going to speak until I saw my colleague raise his hand because, as you know, Tito, I've been getting calls and emails about this all day, all week. This is my district for those of you that are not aware. So I have a few concerns, a few questions that I've received because I thought the callers would go ahead and ask these, but I'll ask for them. How do you define a unit? So a four bedroom single family house, say they have enough square footage per bedroom to accommodate three tenants. Could they divide a four bedroom house into a 12 bedroom or 12, in a, a facility that houses 12, people in terms of congregate living then the i'm sorry i was muted so no the maximum number of beds in a congregate living unit are 10 um and then and then again the amount of beds that someone would be able to add depends on how much parking they can provide and whether or not you know the planning commission thinks it's a, it's an inappropriate uh project so they would need to go to the planning commission so if it was too dense for that particular lot or they couldn't provide the parking or there was some other issue uh the planning commission could could deny that that proposal <coughs> Thank um, but, but there is a cap at 10 bedrooms and then you speak of grandfathering in for those that are legal non-conforming by what date would they have had to obtain this status to be grandfathered in. So if something it, if something was legally a five bedroom or six bedroom or a nine bedroom unit at the time of this being adopted, 
then that that would be grandfathered. Okay. And um, so just for those that are on the call and those that may not be aware, parking is a premium, period, for even a four bedroom single family uh, dweller like myself. We often have students parking and I, uh, again, you can Google where I live, but if you include 250 feet, is it beholden upon the owner to find spaces or is the resident then allowed to park in the non rezoned area because it meets the 250 feet requirement? So the, it, the property owner would be required to do it. So if somebody um, wanted to either legalize an existing congregate living building or create a new one, convert one, build one, they would have to go to the planning commission and they would have to show that they meet the minimum parking requirement. And they could do that if, if this rule change goes into effect, they could do that on a privately owned lot within 250 feet. And they would have to demonstrate that they have control over that lot. And they would have to demonstrate that that uh, parking would be available in perpetuity as long as um, it's necessary to serve the congregate living use. So it would be the owner's responsibility and they would have to prove that, that they can do that before they get approved by the planning commission. Perfect. And that would not include city streets nor city parks. No, it would have to be um, off street parking. Okay, thank you for that. And then finally, um, hold on one second, I'm sorry. What would happen to those that are out of compliance in the areas that are not part of this rezoning proposal. So if there is a house on Lathrop Avenue going towards Millard, what would happen to them? Because they are no longer following the zoning ordinance and will there be stricter penalties put in place for landlords that are not following the zoning or ordinance, the zoning, the, the laws based upon this new rezoning structure? So that, that property owner would have to, after the grace period, whatever that turns out to be, lease to a different group that is a family or functions like a family. Um, you know, they would have to basically change their tenant or, or they could sell the property too. Um, but they would not be allowed to continue uh, renting to groups of four or more students. Um, and that is that's important for all other districts to understand as well. We, ha we have a lot of advocates for this particular part of town to rezone. But if there are landlords in District 2, District 1, District 5, and 6, and 7 that are not following the zoning laws, then they will be held accountable, correct? That's correct, yeah. And as far as whether or not there are stiffer penalties, there's nothing proposed right now. Um, but, you know, the, the nature of the change or, or the text itself makes it easier to enforce the penalties that we have on the books right now. Awesome. But it's still beholden upon the city. The burden of proof is upon whom? So the, the, okay. what this legislation does is it makes it so that it's, it's black and white. The zoning officer could go, could go in. Uh, determine whether or not they're enrolled in a university by checking the directory or, or however the case may be. And that, uh, that, can, be, that can be cited. Um, it would then be on the students to prove that they are a family if in fact they are. There, obviously there are some, there are gonna be some instances where I guess it's possible that there's a group of students that are actually related. They would have a chance to appeal by going to the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, but uh, it, the burden of proof would be on them to prove that they're not students. Okay, and then finally, as, as those that are on the call may be aware, some of these properties are and are adjacent to the ben, uh, Abel Bennett tract. And so those are larger homes. 
And yes, I think the maximum you said was four bed, uh, five plus units would be considered congregate living. But it is also, if you're able to have four independently functioning people in four independent bedrooms, that then allows four cars, four different bags of trash without any requirement to have parking areas nor um, the trash um, units that are required. They would then be expected to have trash compactors as would any other family. The problem comes when we do have a five bedroom unit with 10 people and the trash is strewn about without any requirements uh, such as a, um, one of the big units that are provided by the local uh, trash agencies. Is that, so I know we discussed this for um, multi-unit families, I think zoning discussed this, planning and zoning discussed this, but is there a possibility of adding a requirement for trash for properties that are then deemed uh, congregate living uh, establishment? Uh, yeah, that's something we can look at is, is you know, we can work with court counsel on how to word that. Um, but I would say that the fact that we're requiring a special use permit from the planning commission. So we're requiring planning commission review if you want to do concrete living. Um, that sort of controls for that because one of the things that the planning commission is charged with doing is, is making sure that there's adequate uh, like waste disposal. So is there a dumpster? Is there an enclosure for garbage receptacles? That's something that the planning commission would be controlling. Um, as part of their review. Perfect. And if I have residents that continue to write before this is actually brought back to council, what are the next best steps for them to verbalize their concerns for this body to um, review? Um, they, they can continue emailing planning at cityofbinghamton.gov and we would make sure that we get those comments to the, to the city clerk. Um, as far as the planning commission, they could uh, issue a recommendation as soon as tonight. And so that would sort of end their role in the process. Um, but there would still be plenty of opportunity to, to, to submit comment to council um, before a vote takes place. Um, and again, if they send those comments to planning at cityofbinghamton.gov, we we'll make sure that they get those comments get to city council. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone on the planning committee for your time. Good night. All right, thank you. All right, any other comments from anybody? Anybody wanna raise their hand? Uh, uh, Nick, we have Austin Donaldson raising his hand again. Um, if you'd like to give him permission to speak. Yeah, definitely. If he's interested in talking again. Okay, Austin, you can you can speak now. Sorry, I, I didn't need to press that. I, I, we're all good on our end. Okay. <laughs> all right. Any any phone calls come in? Nope. Okay. Well. What do you think? No other hands raised? No, no. Right. I think I want to give them one more opportunity to raise their hand just to make sure that we didn't cut anybody off. All right. You got one more chance. <clears throat> and while we're waiting, uh, Tito, are we, you're looking for a motion tonight for a recommendation for approval, approval with revisions, denial? Yeah, I mean, it's up to you all. If you if you think you need more time, that's that's perfectly fine. But um, yeah, it would be a a motion to recommend approval. I think based on what I'm hearing, subject to certain changes, um, the offsite parking, the ability to provide parking offsite, um, and I don't know uh, if you all want to address the 
uh, dumpsters or waste disposal as part of it too, or we can leave that up to council, but um, it would be a motion to approve with changes. Okay. All right, yeah, I think, I think you covered it pretty well. The, the trash issue gets covered when somebody comes in for a review by us pretty uh, it's pretty standard review uh, part. I of understand it. that it may not be a bad idea though to have it as a uh, and to take this opportunity to amend the congregate living section to make sure that it's something that has to be checked off in that box on the site plan, so that we so that by oversight. I know we never make oversights. So if there's not a mistake made, where we forget to do that as part of the planning. Committee. I know we've been very good about it, but I can't assume that you guys are all going to be on this planning commission forever. So it would. Sort of memorialize it for, for perpetuity that it was done. All right. Nick, we actually have a call here. All right. I'm going to go ahead and put them on speaker. Hello, can you still hear us? Hello? Hello, can you hear us? Hi, yeah. Okay, you can go ahead and state your name um, and address for the record and then and then uh, give us the comment. Okay, my name is Liza Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R -E at 11 Chestnut Street in Binghamton. Um, I live next to a house that has been turned into student housing and then the one right across from that has also been turned into student housing. The one across at 14 Chestnut has only three students living there, um, but they have friends over every weekend. There are multiple cars. Was it yesterday or Saturday? One of the days they had like a day long drink. I think it was Saturday. Day long drinking and music really loud and everything. I did end up calling the police on 13 Chestnut, not this past weekend, but the one before because it was midnight and there was loud music. There were strangers in my yard. There's kids parked up and down Johnson, all over Chestnut. Um, I talked to the girls next door. I don't really want to have to be in the position to call the police and I don't feel like I should have to, to live in my neighborhood. So I don't know that the restriction of saying, oh, three college students is okay. We literally have from number two to number 20 on our block that's supposed to be single family housing. Um, I have no problem with it being, and my neighbors too, I'm not just speaking for myself. It's people all the way down Johnson, it's people on Chestnut. Um, you know, there are houses that are rented out to single families or a single person, and that doesn't seem to be a problem. Those aren't the only rentals on our street, but the students bring a whole different element of everything. Um, and I just feel like there is enough housing for them. And I also, I'm on the Binghamton School Board, and one of the issues we've been talking about is decreased enrollment and talking about maybe closing an elementary school. But part of the problem with parents being able to, is that parents can't get affordable um, around Fort Man or around Jefferson. Um, and I think these rentals, even just in these couple blocks, are definitely having um, an effect on our student enrollment. So, you know, they also mentioned in our uh, school board meeting that Dr. Stanger had talked to Tanya Thompson and said there's more than enough on campus housing for students. I guess they might want to live off campus. I have two college students myself, but I just feel like to preserve our neighborhood and have some kind of balance. Um, with the university students, our neighborhoods need to be protected. It's not asking for a lot. It's asking that the codes that are there be enforced um, and that we actually have respect for single, what's called, I mean, if you're going to call it single family, it should be a single family, not all these different exceptions. So I guess that's my only comment. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, comment. excellent point. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for the call. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your consideration. And I just, I know myself as well, as well as a lot of you and a lot of people 
on the west side or all over Binghamton have, you know, grown up in this area, moved back to this area, have invested in their properties, and it's, there just has to be a better balance that also weighs on the homeowner side. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. That was an excellent point. <laughs> it's got me rethinking this whole thing. <laughs> I don't know that we need to rethink it, Nick. I mean, like Tito said earlier, this is the next logical step. It's a pro it's a progression. You're not going to get it all at once. Yeah. All right. All right, any other phone calls, Tito? No. Okay. Any other raised hands? No. All right, uh, are we okay closing the public hearing or do you wanna leave this open? Is that for staff or for the other board members? Uh, I guess for everyone, are we gonna make a motion tonight? Probably. I, I would be happy making a motion tonight. Okay. Uh, Brian, you good, good if we close it now? I believe that you're free to close it now. Okay. All right, so let's close the public hearing on the student housing legislation. All right, any discussion about this or anybody wanna make a motion or? Talk about it further. I'm I'm happy to make a motion. I I like the project and I, I like the map that was developed in the legislation. I know one of the things that was mentioned was the inclusion of um, the 250 foot parking suggestion. Um, I'm not sure how official our language needs to be, but. You know, I'd be, and we also they also talk about you know possibly updating with with the trash um, dumpster requirement or something. Um, I'm okay with making a recommendation that city council that we approve this and send it to city council for their consideration, and consider and you know they should want to consider the 250 foot rule and the trash rule. How's right. that for some verbiage? That sounds good to me. Brian, did that sound all right? Um, I believe so, but I think Tito will probably end up drafting the letter for you and circulating it private to you. So Tito, is that sufficient information for you to draft a letter, a recommendation? I, yeah, I just missed what he said about the trash. That we, we want you guys to consider the trash along with uh, the 250 foot parking rule. Okay. For possible updates and... Okay. So you recommend approval subject to including language, allowing uh, offsite parking be located remotely within 250 feet um, and encouraging council to consider regulations around garbage storage. Yeah. That's great. To quote John Lovitz, that's the ticket. <laughs> All right, is there a second on Chris's motion? All second. All right, seconded by Manny. Uh, all in favor? Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Manny? Yes. All right, I'm also a yes. Six in favor, zero opposed. Excellent motion. <laughs> all right. So that covers student housing le legislation. So now we're on to everyone's favorite topic, cannabis business legislation. I'm guessing Tito is gonna have some stuff to talk about for this one too. Yes, um, so this one is, is a little more straightforward. Um, all of this legislation does is it defines 
uh, cannabis related businesses under three categories, which are based on the categories that the state has set for their licenses. So there'll be three types of cannabis businesses. They'd be industrial, that is like uh, growing, processing and distributing. Uh, they'd be in, so the industrial cannabis business, there'd be an on-site consumption cannabis business use, which is for places where you would go to consume cannabis sort of socially or recreationally similar to like a, a how a bar works for alcohol. And then there's cannabis retail, which is where you would go buy cannabis products and take them off site. Um, just retail, you buy them and take them home. So those would be three new uses in the code. And then the other thing that the amendment does is that it allows those uses in certain districts. So industrial cannabis would be allowed in industrial districts and so on. Um, so similar to the student housing legislation, we're looking for a recommendation to city council to approve, approve the conditions or deny. The other thing you're seeing on this map is the state law has school buffers and place of worship buffers. And we've included that on the map just for sort of educational purposes to see, to show where that, what, what, how that affects things as well. Hmm. Um, Nick, I actually have a question about that. Yeah. And maybe this is for Brian, maybe this is for Tito, maybe this is for some state bureaucrat who's not on the call. Um, but about those red striped buffers on the map around schools, two questions. First, uh, it was brought to my attention by somebody that St. James has a school in Johnson City, which is technically off of the Binghamton portion of the map, but maybe the red striping would overlap like sort of like the north west corner um so i'm not sure if that's been considered or or if it needs to be considered when when this map is possibly redrafted um <clears throat> a second question that was brought to my attention was the binghamton city school district has recently circulated some mailings to homeowners and residents about potential plans to rebuild and or close schools. If a school is closed, what happens to the red striped bubble? Is that permanent or does the red striped bubble go away if a school is closed? So uh, first St. James is, is more than 500 feet away um, okay. from the border and then if a school were to close, then then yeah, effectively the the red bubble I think would go away. Um, and I just want to point out that this map is not a rezoning or anything we're doing. We're just showing the buffers where people would not be able to get licenses. So it it for each new business that wants to open, they would still have to work through the state to get a license. And yeah. if if the school is active, then they won't be able to. And if it's not, then the state the state would allow it. Okay. Um, All right. Any other questions or concerns? Anybody, anybody vehemently against this? Mr. Chairman, you, as you probably may have surmised, this also set for public hearing was advertised for public hearing. So there's public members of the public that may want to comment on this as well. Ah, I got you. All right, well, let's take care of that right away then. Uh, all right, so let's open the public hearing for the cannabis business legislation. If anybody is on the Zoom call that would like to speak about this, uh, please raise your hand using the button at the bottom of the Zoom program. And if anybody would like to call in, the number to call is 607-772-7028. Um, so we have Councilman Burns here. Um, Councilman, I believe you can speak now. Yeah, yeah, Tito, thank you. Tito, uh, the on-premises 
use. Will they be actually smoking the marijuana? So we're a little bit, the state's a little bit behind, I think, on the specifics of this, but I do not know. Uh, the last information I got on that was suggested that no, it would be for non-smokable cannabis products. Right. But that's right. that, as far as I know right now, is not set in stone. Right. My, my concern would be the, the Clean Air Act in that when, uh, when cigarette smoking was then outlawed in restaurants and everything, there were many restaurants who I actually agree with that said that you don't have to come into my restaurant. We're going to, I want to allow smoking. And, and the law said no, because the employees then, well, they don't, they can go work somewhere else. No, they can't because you, they're, you're making people choose between their health and their employment. So it was completely outlawed. Nobody could smoke anywhere. And now, if they're going to, if they're going to allow smoking, I do know like the CDC has on their website about uh, pregnant women smoking marijuana. So theoretically we could have a young woman uh, not knowing that she's pregnant for the first six or eight weeks or whatever, and breathing in this smoke for that eight weeks. So my concern is this, the actual smoking of it in a closed environment. Um, and also, it, I, I think that it encourages uh, the driving while intoxicated because I can go into a restaurant. I don't, I don't drink. I can go into a restaurant and come out and not be drunk. And so I can go in with a group of people and I can drive them home because I'm out with them. You cannot have everybody go into a place where it's full of marijuana smoke and expect anybody to come out and be the designated driver unless they were waiting in the car. So, you know, I think it there's all kinds of problems that go with this that uh, I am concerned with. Anyway, that's, thank you very much. All right, excellent points. All right, anybody else? Um, comment? Let's see, slow down. Nope, and no phone calls. No phone calls? All right, let's wait uh, one more minute. What a time to be alive. <laughs> That's you got that right. <laughs> Uh, and again, this is changing uh, all the time, but uh, again, the last I heard that the state um, was saying that wherever tobacco smoking is not permitted, cannabis smoking would, would also not be permitted. So um, just in reference to Councilman Burns's question. Thank you, excellent. All right, well. See no other hands raised and no phone calls coming in. Uh, let's uh, close the public hearing for the cannabis legislation, cannabis business legislation. Uh, all right. Anybody have any comments, questions about anything? Anybody want to make a motion? I Nick. Yes. I think it's just it's it's. I'm glad, I'm just glad to see that the city's taking a proactive lead on on this uh with, with, with i don't know if any how many other cities are planning this stuff out in, in advance so they can be ready when these types of things are are gonna be coming down the pike so yeah hooray for binghamton yeah this is great <laughs> i'll make a motion to accept and propose and send it along to city council for consideration all right motion 
to recommend approval, sounds like. Yes. All right. I'll second. All right. Seconded by Manny. Uh, all in favor, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Manny? Yes. And I'm also a yes. So that's six in favor, zero opposed. All right. All right, and then the last thing on our other business is the rezoning of 187 Clinton Street. Yeah, so uh, Nick, this is actually a city request to rezone 187 Clinton Street. Um, we have a, a proposal in the works that we're looking to get funded by the state to develop affordable housing um, at this location. And uh, right now this lot is zoned industrial um, and industrial districts do not permit dwelling units. And so uh, in order to do a mixed use building on this site, we would need to rezone it to C4. Um, there are other options, but C4 makes the most sense because most of Clinton Street, including to the North, East and West is already C4 neighborhood commercial. So it would fit um, into the neighborhood. Um, and it would allow those dwelling units to be built there. Like we mentioned before, during the student housing conversation, we have a shortage of housing, not just affordable housing, but housing at every price point. So um, we wanted to do what we could to facilitate this project. All right. Is this, uh, does this need a public hearing or this is just straight up our recommendation for approval or denial? Um, this does not require a public hearing from the Planning Commission. We could open it up to comment if anybody's here. Um, it, that's up to you. Um, but a, a recommendation would be enough. All right. Uh, all right. Let's throw it open to public comment if anybody's on the Zoom call that would like to speak about it. Why not? Um, so this is the, we're opening a public hearing about the rezoning of 187 Clinton Street. If anybody would like to speak about that, they could raise their hand. Uh, if anybody wanted to call in about it, uh, number 607-772-7028. We'll wait uh, one minute. So we have Councilman Burns with his hands raised. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but you can go ahead and speak, Councilman, if you'd like. No, that was up uh, from last time. Okay. I'm good. Mr. Chairman, just so you're aware, I don't believe that this was actually noticed for the public to speak. So that don't take the lack of participants as being somehow not in favor or that it's not important. All right. Sounds good. Well, in that case, since we don't have any calls and no hands are raised, we'll close that uh, public hearing. Uh, this doesn't seem to be controversial. Anybody have any uh, concerns or questions about this? All right, if not, I'm gonna make a motion that uh, Planning Commission uh, recommends approval of this proposal. I'll second, Nick. All right, second by Paul. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, before there's a vote, can I just make two comments for the record? Yeah. I want you to be aware of, if you could just scroll down to the, to the map, the zoning, the colored zoning map. I want you to note that this would be changed to be consistent with the red that's around those lots. Also, it's consistent with the with the comprehensive plan and what they're recommending for this area as well. I just think it's part of, important that those be noted in the record before you make the votes. And, and one more thing, uh, Nick, is that we will be doing public noticing prior to the city council. Uh, business meeting. So we will be notifying the public of the opportunity to speak at that meeting. All right. Great. All right. There was a motion and it was seconded. I think it was seconded. It was seconded. It by was. Yes. All right. All in favor. Uh, Mario? Yes. Paul? Yes. Chris? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Manny? Yes. All right. I'm also a yes. So that's six in favor, zero opposed. All right. Any other business? 
I'm happy to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> all right. We probably, yes, we should do that. We should all consider why Chris was uh, had so much information about mushrooms uh, and psychedelic uh, <laughs> events in basements uh, <laughs> earlier. But. I'm going around. Think about this. Yes. Next, when we meet all in person, I will bring it up to share. How's that? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It it was very specific. Your uh, your points on this. <laughs> Brian earmuffs, <laughs> and, and, and we want that one recorded as well. <laughs> all right. Hey, when we... are we going to be back together? Is it gonna Is it gonna happen next month? Never. <laughs> <laughs> We don't. We won't know until the fifteenth. Um, that's when this current state of emergency expires. A uh, couple more days. Yep. Excellent question. All right. I'm sure there was a second on the motion to adjourn. So, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.